Well, welcome. Psalm 117, praise the Lord, all nations, extol him, all peoples, for great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Well, I want to welcome you to Parker Hills. I am James. I am one of the elders here, and I want to personally welcome anyone who is new for the first time. Um, we are a congregation that is a mess, but we will not brag about or boast about what we bring but we boast about Christ and what he has done. So we want to welcome you. Uh, I want to draw your attention to the bulletin. We have a few announcements. Uh, the first of which is that there's a potluck immediately after the service. Uh, if you were unaware of that, um, feel free to come anyway. We've brought plenty of food and we will be discussing what church planting looks like for us. We are in the midst of uh, preparing for that, praying about that. Uh, we do not have firm plans yet, but um, we feel like uh, we have a planter in our midst, and um, we want to continue to pray about that and about, we want to encourage you to, uh, to pray about how you might individually be involved in what God might be doing through that plant. So uh, that is immediately after the service, and uh, please join us. Uh, second is that uh, VBS is um, kicking off in uh, this summer. And so there is uh, the uh, registration for uh, volunteers. We need volunteers to minister to these kids. In the last two years, we have had uh, at least half of the kids that have come have not been uh, members of the church or regular attenders. They're from the community. And so it is a great opportunity for evangelism and for you to personally interact with, with those kids and encourage them to grow in their faith. So, And uh, also in the bulletin, it, it mentioned that... Um, Dave Bartha, our brother, will be moving. Uh, that date has changed from the 24th uh, to March 2nd. So that Saturday, March 2nd. Uh, please contact Ronnie, and she will give you further details. So um, today we have two very exciting events. First of which is that uh, one of the greatest opportunities and pleasures in the church is to see a brother or sister give their testimony and then be baptized. It is the mission of the church that comes from Christ for us to take the, the message, the gospel, to the world, to make disciples, and to see them baptized. And so we have an opportunity for Hugh Fitzpatrick and his daughter-in-law, Misaki, to come and uh, be baptized. She is from J Japan, which is an area that we pray about. We actively uh, support missionaries to J Japan. And it is a, a land that is unreached. By and large, it is unreached, and to see a sister come, she is going to be in front of us be baptized, but then she will be returning back home, and she will bring her testimony and her, her faith to her neighbors and her friends and her family, and so we'll be praying for her that not only that uh, she returns and grows in her faith, but then that she has opportunity for the gospel with her family and her community. And after that, um, our sister will be coming. Uh, up to give her testimony as well for membership, and then um, Jim will be presenting her for that, for the congregation to vote on. So, Hugh, come on up, Misaki. We are very excited to hear your testimony. Oh, oh, one more thing, sorry. Uh, and then Shoshana will be coming after Jim to read uh, the, the passage this morning in Nahum. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, hello, my name is Misaki Fitzpatrick, formerly Misaki Tomimoto. I was born in Japan and raised um, alongside with my four brothers in the Philippines. Uh, I had a hard time growing up with family issues, and the only saving grace was my stepfather's faith. He taught me ever since I was a small girl, and because of his teachings, I saw the flaws in the Catholic schools that I was in. And he ingrained in my thinking that I should hold myself pure and um, that God should be in the center of my life and those lessons struck me the most and I had them with me even as I moved out in Japan. It was in Japan that I had my darkest moments and my faith was tested. And, but praise the Lord, uh, I remained faithful and he blessed me with now my husband and a new family and now that I have a child with me and I see God's work all around me and I truly understand now the prophets in Isaiah. 
uh, Isaiah 41.10 is my whole, my life verse. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And I'm very excited to show my covenant with the Lord. That I will praise him and put him in the center of my life forever. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> As we render the uh, uh, stage here uh, safe once more, we would ask <coughs> Dawn to come up and present her testimony. The elders have heard her testimony and recommend her to the church. Uh, one of the great gifts to the church is that God will drop in on us people who are mature and faithful believers and that is a great joy to us so it was great to see misaki being baptized and now we get to see the other part uh, of membership as dawn comes and shares with us My name is Dawn Doherty. Can you all hear me? Uh oh. There we go. Are we good? Are we good? Doing. Okay. Um, uh, good morning. My name is Dawn Doherty, and um, we, we have been attending church here for. Uh, close to a year. Um, I was uh, born and raised in the East. Um, I grew up in a small town of, out of about 10,000 people in Pennsylvania. Um, my parents were, uh, well, that was in the 1950s, and so everything you've ever heard about the 1950s was true in my life. Um, my mom in a dress, she never wore pants. Um, always uh, a stay-at-home mom and always caring for the family and having a nice dinner and dessert on the table at night. Um, she and my father, of course, lived through the Depression and through World War II, and I'm sure that that shaped their lives. In, in addition to that, they were, um, they were very uh, rule-oriented, and um, our house was very structured. Uh, in a loving way, um, I uh, was a very, com very compliant child and always felt that I um, needed to uh, live up to their expectations, but did live up to their expectations. My biggest sin was that I would have my nose in a book and not come right away to the table for dinner. And so uh, it was, uh, we also um, attended uh, the, a 
Protestant church in town that um, uh, never missed a Sunday, went to Sunday school, went to church, but I never heard the gospel. What a sad uh, reflection when I think back on it, but um, not once in all of my growing up years did I hear the truth of the gospel that we are saved through faith. And I can remember being in upper elementary grades and asking my mom, how do I know that I will get into heaven? And her response was, well, your good works will outweigh your bad works. And, and so I was like, oh, cool, I'm in. Because I, I always, uh, in my mind, uh, did the, uh, the right thing and the good thing. And so um, as I uh, 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 beca- went into h- my high school years and uh, when I was a senior, my uh, older brother went to the Naval Academy and uh, there heard the truth of the gospel for the first time. And he shared that with me and through his testimony and through um, a, uh, a conference weekend that he took me to, the Lord uh, in, uh, impressed on my heart that I was not all pure and perfect like I thought I was. Um, I think so many times, uh, at, at least my experience here in America as I've gone through my life, People think they are okay. They think that they're good because they're comparing their lives to others around them. They're not in jail. They're not, they haven't murdered anybody. Um, and they don't see the, the sin that uh, dwells within and that, we, um, that we, we don't see ourselves unless the Holy Spirit shows it to us. So I was, uh, I was most, uh, I, I was, I was, I was struck that weekend when, when I was with my brother uh, on the sinfulness of sin uh, that dwelt within me, and that the only way to uh, overcome that was through trusting in the blood of Christ. So um, that that was my salvation story, and I would just encourage all of you parents to be sure that your kids know that they're comparing themselves not to those around them, but to the heavenly Father. Um, we, um, uh, my husband and I have been married for over 50 years. We have four children, nine grandchildren. Two of our kids live here in the area, which is why we retired, uh, uh, where we, why we ended up here after we retired. And um, I guess the only other thing to mention is that I um, worked, uh, we lived for 40 years in Vermont. And for 20 of those, I was a stay-at-home mom, and the other 20 years, I worked in a Christian school and um, was a teacher and uh, a principal. So that's kind of my background. So I think that's it, Jim. No suspense, but this is real. Will you commit to welcoming Dawn into our fellowship investing into her life and letting her invest into yours and speak into yours. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Welcome, Don. This is so good. I'm going to fix a tripping hazard, and then we'll have our... No, please keep coming. I'll be back. I didn't trip. Yay. Page 782, Nahum 2, verses 3 through 10. The shield of his mighty men is red. His soldiers are clothed in scarlet. The chariots come with flashing metal on the day he musters them. The cypress spears are brandished. The chariots race madly through the streets. They rush to and fro through the squares. They gleam like torches. They dart like lightning. He remembers his officers. They stumble as they go. They hasten to the wall. The siege tower is set up. The river gates are opened. The palace melts away. Its mistress is stripped. She is carried off, her slave girls lamenting, moaning like doves and beating their breasts. Nineveh is like a pool whose waters run away. Halt, halt, they cry, but none turns back. Plunder the silver, plunder the gold. There is no end of the treasure or of the wealth of all precious things. 
desolate, desolation and ruin. Hearts melt and knees tremble. Anguish is in all loins. All faces grow pale. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the chance to be here, um, to hear your word and to worship you with people who know you and who love you. I pray that you would still our minds and our hearts, help us to be receptive to hearing from you. I pray that we would be open to what we hear and that we would have direct opportunity and boldness to apply it each day this week. We love you, Lord, and may that continue to grow. In your name we pray. Would you stand? If you're new to church, uh, you're in for a treat. Most people who've gone to church for 20 or 30 years have never heard a sermon on Nahum chapter 2. <laughs> if you were listening when Shoshana was reading, it's a description of a battle. I think the thing I've been most impressed by through the word, through Jonah and Nahum, is that God is not a cuddly, soft God. Is God the, the Lamb of God who is gentle? Yes, absolutely. But is he the Lion of the tribe of Judah who defends his own? Absolutely. This morning we're going to start us with a song where we will call God the Lord of hosts. That's God's warrior name. He is the Lord, the, the captain of heaven's armies. So as you sing this song this morning, uh, let's think of God as our warrior God. Try. 
Father, we, we come before you this morning, at, gathered as your people, in this local gathering here, Lord, and we, we praise you, Lord, we praise you that you are coming one day, and though you're reigning now from your throne, you will reign one day in a way where your rule and reign is unresisted, undisputed, unrivaled. Your will will be done across the earth in every heart and mind. Your people will submit to you and bow. They'll be set free from the rule of sin in their lives. 
with glorified bodies, Lord. We long for that day. We say gladly with that song, see he comes upon the clouds. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we await the coming day, Lord. We praise you that you are a God who is jealous in avenging, that you take vengeance on your adversaries, that you're slow to anger, you're great in power, Lord, that you'll by no means clear the guilty. Father, we pray that as we continue this series on God and his enemies through Jonah and Nahum, Father, that you would be doing a deep work in our hearts. That we would be compelled to have a heart of mercy towards your enemies and towards ours. Lord, that you, you would help us as your people to reflect your heart. You would help us to pray for our enemies, to bless them, Lord, to love them. Not to curse them. Lord, you would help us to, to take the gospel to them with gladness and boldness, Father. Father, you would help us as a church be a church that is bringing the gospel to every corner of this community. That you would fill us with your spirit in boldness to, to see the gospel come, Lord. That you would break down the strongholds of fear and cowardice in our hearts. That you would break down the strongholds of love for this world finding our comfort in the things of this world, Lord, that you would help us be a church that reflects the call of Jesus to take up our crosses and follow him, to deny ourselves, to lay our lives down, to lose our lives, Lord, to bring the gospel to the lost. Lord, we so easily grow comfortable and complacent. Lord, help us to have a renewed burden for lost people. And help us cast aside the idols that inhibit us from bringing the gospel to them, Lord. Lord, we pray also for the conversion of political leaders across this country. And we pray for the conversion of lost people in our community. In our neighborhoods, Father. We pray that you would bring a revival of conversion in this community and in this state, Lord, and in this country. We pray that you would convert many political leaders. Lord, that they would fear you, that they would seek to carry out their roles in office in a way that, that establishes justice, Lord. That they would seek to ser serve you in those offices, Lord, and, and not serve their own agendas, Lord. We, we pray for that. We pray that you would help us to bring the gospel to them, Lord. We pray for that even in the wake of the coming of a in, in the wake of the coming election, Lord, for conversion, for radical changes in the lives of our politicians in this country, that we might serve you, that we might, that we might carry out our mission, Lord, in peace, like, like you tell us in 1 Timothy. Lord, we pray for the families in this church, Lord. Thank you for the Olivers, for the Parkinsons, for my own family, Lord. Pray for our marriages, that you would strengthen our marriages, Lord. You'd help Connor and James and I love our wives well, Lord, love our families well. You'd help us disciple our children together, bringing them up in the fear of the Lord, gladly pointing them to the goodness of Jesus, Lord. Help us do that with diligence, Lord. Thank you for all the ways that these families contribute to this church, for the ways that they faithfully serve you, Lord. Strengthen them in, in all that they're doing, Lord. Continue to grow us in what you're doing, Father. We pray for our church planting meeting today, Father that your will would be done, that you would be going ahead of us as, as we talk about church planting today, as we, we talk about the ways that we sense you're leading, Lord. You'd help us have a fruitful discussion. You would unify our hearts together, Lord, to carry out this good work for your namesake. Lord, we pray for other churches in this community and, and other communities nearby us, Lord. Thank you for Redemption Parker. We thank you for Cross Family Church, Lord, as they're seeking to get off the ground for the good work that they're trying to do, Lord. Thank you for Harvest Bible Church and Elizabeth and Reformation, Lord. We pray that you would, you would protect the pastors there, the elders. You would help all of these churches seek to be faithful to your word, faithful to your gospel, Lord, uncompromising. You'd help them to shepherd their people well, Lord, and point them to Jesus each day. 
pray that you would give us unity and camaraderie with these churches, Lord, that any sort of competition between the churches would be done away with, Lord, and that we would love each other and speak well of each other, Lord. We ask that as Josh comes and preaches from Nahum, Father, that you would fill him and anoint him with your spirit for the proclamation of this message. Lord, give us hearts that are open and receptive. Give us hearts that bow before your word and tremble before you, Lord, wanting to submit to you and love you and obey you, Lord. And speak to us, Lord. Give us a sense as Josh is preaching. This is not a man bringing your word to us, but this is the living God speaking to us by his spirit. Help us love you more, Lord. Honor you more. Serve you more wholeheartedly. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Everyone said, Amen. Thank you, James. Thanks to the musicians <clears throat> for leading us this morning to the Fitzpatricks. And congratulations to that family for this baptism in their household. Wonderful morning already. I want to invite you to open to Nahum chapter 2, page 782. If you're using the Bible that's from the seat that's right there in front of you, I hope you'll open a Bible either on your phone or that one or the one you brought with you. I'm so thankful God gets to decide what we talk about when we're together, which is my way of saying at Parker Hills, our philosophy for what we teach is just take books of the Bible and explain them. I'm so glad God gets to decide what we talk about when we're together because I would never have chosen to talk about some of these things. God wants to talk to us this morning about visualization. I remember the first time I encountered visualization. You know what I mean by that? This sort of self-improvement technique. That's not what God's trying to do with us, but in our culture, this self-improvement technique where you cultivate mental images of a positive outcome or a change you want to see in yourself you want to experience that in reality, so you visualize it in your imagination. I remember the first time I encountered it. A friend in college was going through a serious medical illness, a serious illness, and had started receiving medical treatment. And her doctor suggested to her that she use visualization, that she stop what she was doing several times a day and imagine the therapy healing her body as she just closed her eyes and pictured that. So she told me she was picturing, she, she was using this image of tiny Hessian soldiers, like from the Revolutionary War, little hired German mercenaries, like, like marching through her body, waging war against this illness and eliminating the disease inside of her. It's the first time I had ever heard of that. Now, since then, I've encountered it a lot in self-help literature, the testimony of elite athletes, medical treatment, a host of other fields. I'm sure you have too. It seems to just be growing in popularity as we and our culture try more and more to harness the mysterious power of the mind-body connection. I don't have much to say about that. I actually don't. I don't care about the origins of it. I don't care about whether you know, it works or doesn't. That's not my point at all. What's interesting to me is how our text for today actually uses it. Our text is not recommending that we do it or anything like that. It doesn't recommend that people sit and imagine a positive outcome. It actually shows them a positive outcome in dramatic and vivid detail. Now, I want to be clear, it's not a text about self-improvement or achievement. No one wins the masters with a perfect putt in today's text. I, I meant that to be somewhat sarcastic. No one wins the masters with a perfect putt in this text. No one overcomes their fear of bats by picturing themselves in a cave with these leathery, furry, toothed, you know, flying creatures fluttering around their heads. That's not what's happening at all. Instead, this text is a detailed, real, look at it, Nahum chapter 2, verses 3 through 10, if you were listening as Shoshana read, you know this is a detailed, real-time description of the collapse and fall of Nineveh, the most feared existential threat to God's people. When Nineveh conquered, they wiped out their foes. 
This was an existential threat. It threatened the very existence of the people of God. And this text is a description of their fall. And here's the thing. There's no explanation given for why this text is here, and there's no apparent need for it in the agenda of the book itself. Unless the purpose of seeing Nineveh fall is simply to accomplish something in the mind and hearts of readers when they see it happen in their mind's eye. In the program of the book, that's not necessary to what Nahum seems to be trying to do. I mean, it doesn't give us the promise of Nineveh's fall. That was the last text that James preached last Sunday, where God promises he will humble Nineveh, and people can hope in that. It's not that. This isn't the rationale for Nineveh's fall. That was in the first sermon we heard from the beginning of Nineveh where God describes himself and why it is in his nature that this city must be put down. It's not even a reminder of the evil of Nineveh. That's the last portion of this book. The evil that deserved to be treated this way. That's how the book closes. We'll look at that next Sunday. In this text, the promised fall of Nineveh takes place before our very eyes. Look at it. We see invaders charging and breaching walls and plundering the city. We hear their shouts to each other and the conquered citizens moaning in anguish. We watch as the populace of Nineveh goes off into captivity. We see pale faces and weak knees and melting hearts. Why is this here? What could Nahum's purpose be in visualizing for his readers how it went down when when Nineveh collapsed? What could his purpose be? Why would he stoke their imagination with the speed of the assault and the helplessness of Nineveh's defenses and the utter collapse of that powerful city? Why would he give his readers a vision of their fiercest foe, desolate and ruined? Be thinking about that as we go through. Why is this here? Let me explain it. There are three stanzas. The first one, verses 3 through 5, is the siege of the city. Verses 6 through 9 is the collapse of the castle. And verse 10 is the rapid recap. Those are the three stanzas. The siege of the city, 3 through 5. The collapse of the castle, 6 through 9. And the rapid recap. The first stanza is those first three verses. The siege of the city. Look at verse 3. The shield of his mighty men is red. His soldiers are clothed in scarlet. The chariots come flashing, come with flashing metal on the day he musters them. The cypress spears are brandished. The chariots race madly through the streets. They rush to and fro through the squares. They gleam like torches. They dart like lightning. He remembers his officers. They stumble as they go. They hasten to the wall. The siege tower is set up. Now, in spite of the grim content, the poetry is actually really aesthetically pleasing. Let me just point out what's going on in the poetry of the stanza. There's this nice sort of mirror structure to it. In verse 3a, the men approach. In 3b, the chariots approach. In verse 4, the chariots are engaged in battle. And in verse 5, the men are engaged in battle. There's design, there's stylization to the poetry. But more than that, I'm sure you notice the staccato effect of the short sentences and vivid images and dynamic verbs. Notice how short the sentences are? You can feel the chaos and the frenzy of the battle. That's the purpose of giving this to us in poetry. Notice that visual images dominate this whole stanza. You don't get the sounds or the smells of battle. Instead, we see the sights, right? Look at it. You see color and flashing lights and weapons of war and rapid movement, chariots and spears and siege towers. In verse 3, the color red dominates. Nineveh fell to that new power of Babylon whose armies wore scarlet. Notice the way the poet uses light. Verse 3, flashing metal off the chariots. Verse 4, gleam like torches, dart like lightning. Chariots and horses 
and marching, running armies, they raised a lot of dust. But through the dust, you can see in your mind's eye these flashes of light that penetrate through the haze of battle. The overall point of this stanza is the speed of the battle and how unstoppable that army is that's coming against Nineveh. Look at it. Verse 4. Chariots race madly. They rush to and fro. Verse 5. Pictures officers running so fast they're tripping over themselves getting to the wall. That's what's happening in verse 5. There's so much frenzy, so much haste. And and Nahum's just describing it for us, just setting it out there in our mind's eye. Who's the he? You notice there's this he and this his that sort of dominates the stanza. The shield of his mighty men is red. His soldiers. Verse 5, he remembers his officers. Well, it could be the scatterer. Look back up at chapter 2, verse 1. There's this unnamed enemy just called the scatterer who has come up against you. That verse is addressed to the city of Nineveh. So the he in this stanza could be the scatterer. Um, It's highly possible that it's just that agent. But the closest referent is actually in verse 2. Do you see that? The Lord is restoring the majesty of Jacob and the majesty of Israel. It's very possible that it's the Lord. I mean, back up in chapter 1, the Lord explicitly claims responsibility for the fall of Nineveh. Look at verse 9. Nahum 1.9. Why do you plot? What do you plot against the Lord? He will make a complete end. Trouble will not arise a second time. Verse 14. Speaking to Nineveh. The Lord has given command about you. No more shall your name be perpetuated from the house of your gods. I will cut off carved images and metal image. I will make your grave, for you are vile. So it seems to be the Lord's army, the Lord's officers, the Lord's chariots in this stanza. That doesn't mean he used a supernatural um, opponent or a supernatural force to wipe out Nineveh. No, it simply means he used the Babylonians as his agent to get it done. So stanza one. 3-5, Three through five, shows the siege of the city, swift and unstoppable. Let's look at the collapse of the castle in verses six through nine. The second stanza. The river gates are opened. The palace melts away. Its mistress is stripped. She's carried off her slave girls lamenting, moaning like doves and beating their breasts. Nineveh is like a pool whose waters run away. Halt, halt, they cry, but none turns back. Plunder the silver, plunder the gold. There's no end of the treasure or of the wealth of all precious things. So the second stanza, like the first one, is really clearly aesthetically stylized. This is, this is beautiful poetry, the content notwithstanding. This one doesn't have that same sort of chiastic structure. This one has a parallel structure. Look, verse 6, water imagery, the palace melts away. Same in verse 8, water imagery, the people run away. In between, you've got verse 7, the victims are taken. And in verse 9, the wealth is taken. So you've got water imagery, the palace melting, and victims taken away. Then you've got water imagery, the people run and the wealth is taken away. It's possible that this flood imagery is metaphorical for this surging enemy uh, army. But it's also possible that literal water played a role in the fall of Nineveh. We just don't know. We do know the city was built on the east bank of the Tigris River. There was a moat that surrounded the city 150 feet wide, filled with water diverted from that river and others that flowed through the city itself. Inside the moat, 150 foot wide water moat around the city, inside that moat was a wall that was 60 feet tall in places rising to 100 feet tall and so wide that three chariots could ride next to each other along the top of this wall. In addition to that, there were towers, some of which rose 200 feet above the ground to support the wall and the troops that would be used to defend the city. This is an impregnable force. There were 15 gates, all reinforced, that would offer entrance into the city. 
Some speculate that the Babylonians closed the gates of the dam that was further upstream on the Tigris River and some of these others. They closed those gates, dammed up that river for some time, and then opened those gates and water rushed through the city and literally melted all of those defenses. That could be what verse 6 is describing. You see that, right? Once the palace is washed away, the rest of the city collapses as well. In verse 7 now, the sights of battle give way to the sounds. And that's what dominates the rest of this stanza. You've got slave girls in verse 7, moaning like doves. In verse 8, a voice calls out. And in verse 9, another command is shouted. Now we're hearing things, not just seeing. Verse 7, the Hebrew is really difficult to translate. I'm not good at Hebrew, but I can make my way through it enough. And then you notice how many different translations there are in English. Let me just try to explain to you. The subject of verse 7 is ambiguous. The ESV says its mistress is stripped and carried off. But neither the Bible nor history tells us much about the queens of the Assyrian Empire. Those ladies just don't figure much into the story. Besides, and more importantly, there's not really a noun, a subject like that in the Hebrew of the sentence. It's just her. It's just an ambiguous she. So with that generic subject, she, it could refer to the city of Nineveh itself. All of the inhabitants are stripped and all of them are carried away. She, the whole city, is being carried away in verse 7. That's certainly what verse 8 describes. Look at it. The whole city is like a ruined pool whose waters are just rushing out through all the holes in the wall. But the waters aren't water, it's people. Not one person responds to the command to halt. They're just all fleeing. And in verse 9, another voice speaks. This voice doesn't command the citizens to stop. This voice commands the invaders to plunder the wealth. Nineveh was a fabulously wealthy city, and you can imagine why. Every enemy they encountered, they conquered. And when they conquered, they didn't just subjugate and require tribute. They would take everything and hoard it in their capital city. Nineveh was filled with gold and silver and precious stones. Beyond measure, gathered from all these other conquered kingdoms. But now, they are treated just as they treated others. Their citizens are deported. Their wealth is depleted. Verse 10, the third stanza, gives us the rapid recap. Desolate. Desolation and ruin. Hearts melt and knees tremble. Anguish is in all loins. All faces grow pale. So we hear now in the din of this battle, Another voice, it could be the same voice now speaking, but instead of giving a command, it utters a final verdict over the city. Total devastation. People shattered and demoralized. Look at those two words paired up, desolation and ruin. That's the summary. That's the verdict. That's all that's left. And then there's this description of these anguished people, hearts melting, knees trembling, Weak in the loins, pale faces. One commentator sums it up like this. Palmer Robertson says, quote, In any case, the picture pulsates with the reality of the situation. Terror reigns on every side. Those who for generations have made a way of life out of striking fear into the hearts of others now know firsthand the horror and fear of God's own judgment. That's what's happening. So there it is. The description of the battle. Swift and fierce, unstoppable and complete. And we're left with the question, why is this here? It's not a promise. That already happened. It's not rationale. We've seen that earlier. It's not a description of the evil of Nineveh. It's just the fall of the city. Why would Nahum give his readers a vision of their fiercest foe, desolate, and ruined? Here's my best answer. This is what I think this section of Scripture is about. Apparently, God's people need to see their enemies devastated and ruined, crushed 
and defeated. That's all I've got. Apparently, God's people need to see, to see with their mind's eye, their fiercest foe crushed and defeated, devastated and ruined. There are many writers in Scripture who skip the drama of battle. And they just get to the summary. Look at Revelation 19. This stands out most clearly when you get to the final battle at the end of all things. Look at Revelation 19. The end of chapter 19, describing this amazing cataclysmic battle at the end of all things, sets it up in verse 19, Revelation 19, 19. I saw the beast. This is John writing this vision that he's seen coming at the end of time. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. So you're poised to see the battle, the stage is set, the field of battle is filled with opponents and and the armies of heaven. And verse 20, and the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who in his presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped its image and those two were thrown alive into the lake of fire and the rest were slain by the sword that comes from the mouth of him sitting on the horse and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. It's a definitive moment but it's not descriptive at all. Big battle and the beast was captured. That's all you got. Definitive, not descriptive. Nahum does the opposite. It's very descriptive and no explanation as to why. Apparently, Nahum wants his readers to see the battle, to hear the mourners, to watch the city fall. That seems significant to me. In other words, the point of this text is not simply Nineveh falls, but it's something more dramatic like, come see Nineveh fall. Some of you got real uncomfortable when I said, God wants to talk to us about visualization. Some of you were squirming so bad and you're ready to resign your membership because that's Eastern mysticism. And What is happening in this text except visualization? Not for self-improvement. But God wants his people to see the fall of their enemies. The, the point of the text is come see Nineveh. Watch it collapse before your very eyes. The prophet's point has something to do with that. And yet... The description of the city's fall is not filled with wanton violence, is it? It's just not. If an angry man with murderous thoughts toward his enemies were to read this passage, it would not feed his bloodlust, right? Nahum's focus is not even on heroic deeds. The point is the complete inability of Nineveh to defend itself. The point is not be amazed at the great warrior. The point is don't be afraid of that great enemy. That's the point. They can't stop God's destruction of them. That's the point, right? Self-satisfied glee is not the result of reading this. The result of reading this is to diminish any sense of fear or awe that Israel would have about Nineveh. They just don't look that scary anymore as they fall apart. And so I conclude this. This is all I got. God's people need to see their fiercest foe devastated and ruined, crushed and defeated. God's people need to see, not just believe. See. See. For Israel, their fiercest foe at this moment was good as gone. If they read Nahum, they would watch it happen. What would that have done for them? when they watched the most ferocious empire history had ever seen, unstoppable, devastating, devouring, what would it have done for them to see that empire stopped and devastated and devoured? What would that have done for them? I don't know, but I can imagine. Can't you? Their sense of peace and settledness their inability to be flustered by what they heard in the news about the approach of Assyria once again. They just watched Nineveh fall. Their sense of confidence in God, right? Their hope for the future. I can, I can see why God's people need to see their fiercest foe crushed 
and defeated. Have you noticed now the way the New Testament goes out of its way to describe to us in vivid detail the effects of the cross? Because that's where this sermon needs to go. It puzzles me when people think that Israel is somehow equated with America and their political enemies are somehow America's political enemies. That is such horrid theology. The people of God in the Old Covenant were a physical people with physical promises and physical effects. The people of God in the New Covenant are a spiritual people with spiritual promises receiving spiritual benefits and effects. How is that not plain to us? Can we get that nailed down? Okay, so when the New Testament comes to the cross, it doesn't talk about the conquering effect of Jesus' defeat of some political entity, right? James was so clear on this last week, and it was so helpful. The people of God today are a multinational, multi-ethnic group who are unified by their faith in Jesus, and as such, our most ferocious feared enemies are the enemies of all humanity, namely the devil and sin and death. And Jesus took them to the woodshed. The question is, can you see it? Yes, yes, thank you. Can you see it? We need to see it, not just believe it, but see it, all right? Let me give you some texts about this. 1 John 3, 8, Jesus taking it to the devil. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil, How about this one? Colossians 2.15. He disarmed rulers and authorities and put them to open shame, triumphing over them in Jesus. Can you see that with the eyes of your heart? The devil himself who has waged war on humanity since the first creation. And we've never beat him ever one time. No challenger has ever. Israel, God's appointed son, firstborn son, out in the wilderness for 40 years. Why? Because they wouldn't believe God. And every moment in the wilderness was one more death and one more failure after another because they just kept believing lies. Where do those come from? The father of lies. Until one man, the true Israel, goes to battle in the wilderness, 40 days, no food, nothing to drink, and the devil comes to him and he wins. Jesus wins. For the first time ever, a man beat the devil and he never stopped winning. He threw demons out left and right. He said to the disciples, I see Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Can you picture it? Can you picture the devil under his feet, conquered, quivering, scared, defeated, and someday soon, gone. Can you see it? That's why this text is here. How about about death? How about death? That's a bad enemy. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of flesh and blood, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those through who through the fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Or how about 1 Corinthians 15? Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Over what? Death. Are you kidding me? No. Here's this other enemy, formerly undefeated, unstoppable, utterly, utterly impervious to the tears and begging please and prayers of humanity, please don't let my mother die. Please don't let my child die. Please don't let me die. And everybody dies. And death always wins. Until Jesus showed up. Can you see him? That hooded specter with the big sickle reaping one person after another, quivering under Jesus' feet like a coward. Because he wins. How about sin? Hebrews 9.26 As it is, Jesus appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. 
Colossians 2, 13 and 14. You who were dead in trespasses, the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive with Jesus, having forgiven all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. He set it all aside, nailing it to the cross. Can you see it? Can you see sin defeated? The addictions that will not yield, the shame that will not go away, the guilt that you cannot explain away. Can you see it washed away in the flood, not of the Tigris River, but of the blood of Jesus? Can you see it collapsing, washed away? Because you are free. Sin is a defeated foe. All of you who are like, oh man, he's going to talk about visualization. I'm out of here. Aren't you thankful for visualization in the Bible? That's the question. Can you see it? And if you're not a Christian, this is how Christians view the world. We view the world, according to the Bible, as war. But it's not war against people whose politics we don't agree with or other nations It's not even war against individual non-Christians. It's war against the worst enemies of all humanity. And you might not even believe in the devil, but surely you know the effects of guilt, the guilt of sin. And you certainly know that you, like us, are headed for death. What are you going to do about that? Don't you want a champion? Don't you want in Jesus to be able to see it defeated those enemies under his feet. That's what this passage in Nineveh is all about. And it just leaves us with one big conclusion and one big question. God's people need to see their fiercest foes utterly crushed and defeated under his feet. Can you see it? Father, we pray that you would open our eyes in this specific way to the glory of Jesus. That the cross doesn't just erase our guilt, but it defeats our foes. Jesus, we're so grateful to have a champion who came from heaven, suffered under the devil and sin and death for us, and one. Thank you. We love you. We trust you. We admire you. We look to you. And we want more clearly than ever to see you. So please, open our eyes even as we receive communion and sing these closing songs. For it's in your name that we hope and pray. Amen. Communion is another opportunity to visualize. Spurgeon used to say, when you receive communion, don't look at it, look through it. Look through the elements until you can say, yes, I see the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's what the bread and juice are, symbols of Jesus. Bread broken, picturing his body. Grapes crushed, picturing his blood, all given for us. So if you're a Christian, take a few moments, reflect on what you've heard, thank God, picture Jesus conquering, and then come receive bread and wine as symbols of him whom you trust. If you're not a Christian, what we want for you and what the Bible would encourage and exhort you to do is take Jesus as your savior by faith. Don't come take bread and juice. We're happy you're here. We're glad you've listened. We want you to sing along with us and be welcomed by us, but this is the one part of this service we'd ask you not to participate in because these symbols are only fitting and meaningful for people who have already trusted Jesus, all right? So take a few moments, reflect on what you've heard, and then come as we sing.
I changed this last song during the sermon. We've never practiced this. But we have to sing these words. See him there upon the cross, no longer breathing. Imagine it. Close your eyes if you want to during the song. Dust that formed the watching crowd takes the blood of Jesus. Feel the earth shaking. The veil is split in two because he stood before the wrath of God and shielded sinners with his blood. Sing with us. Hang on. Everybody in the key of B. Are you in B? Very important that we do that. (laughs) Follow Heather as she leads.
room with us this morning. Thanks to the music team for following Tom's Audible and the sound booth for pulling that out of your hat. And uh, before you go, let me just pray because we have lunch afterwards, so we'll ask the Lord to bless the food and fellowship. Our Father, thank you so much for your love, sending your Son to conquer all that has come against us. Jesus, thank you. Holy Spirit, we are so pleased that you've been in our midst opening our eyes to these awesome realities. And as we go now, we pray for your continued blessing on our fellowship as we share uh, with one another updates and prayer requests and conversation and encouragement on our bodies as we receive food that we hope will strengthen us and that we can use with that uh, strength to serve you and uh, strengthen our relationships as well. Those who have to leave, we pray that you would send them out with your blessing and make this a fruitful afternoon for us in Jesus' name, amen.